All right, well, hello, my name is Kathy Schultz and I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources. And I would like to welcome everybody to What's Bugging You, our second Water Wednesday live chat. I am here today with Dr. Rosemary Hartman, DWR's Chief Bug Wrangler. And Rosie, when, when we talk about bugs, you aren't talking about butterflies or beetles or stink bugs, right? Well, butterflies and stink bugs are st some of the bugs that we find in the Delta, but I'm using bug as more of a broad term for any kind of little creepy crawly thing. Bug is not a very scientific term, so it's a lot shorter than aquatic invertebrates, which is the technical term for the critters I'm talking about today. All right, sounds good. So like Rosie said, she is going to be introducing you to some of the small even microscopic, like too small to see without a, a microscope, critters that live in the Delta. And if you are joining us through Zoom today, you can actually ask Rosie questions. You'll just wanna to go to the chat box at the bottom of your screen and type them in, and I will read as many of them as I can to her. I can't promise I will get to everybody's questions, um, but I will promise I will get as many as I can. So before I turn things over to Rosie, I just want to give a quick introduction to the Delta for those of you who are not familiar with it. The Sacramento San Joaquin Delta is a large freshwater tidal estuary. It is actually the largest on the west coast of the Americas. And an estuary is where fresh and salt water meet. And if you look behind me, you can see a shot of our Delta. Um, and you can see it's this maze of land and water. And it is among California's most important natural resources. The Delta provides water to over 27 million Californians and thousands of acres of farmland, as well as homes to hundreds, if not thousands of species of wildlife. The Delta is located just inland from the San Francisco Bay, and it's formed where rivers, including the Sacramento and the San Joaquin River meet. Um, like I said, you can see it behind me here. Here's a little bit more of a close up. And you can also see an extreme close up where Rosie is. So the Delta is just this amazing ecosystem. And uh, last week we talked about some of the fish that live in the Delta. If you missed that and would like to learn more about them, you can watch, um, you can catch that on our YouTube channel. But today Rosie's going to be telling us about some of the things that maybe those fish would eat. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rosie to tell us about all the bugs that we find in our Delta. All right, uh, thank you very much. Let me start sharing my screen, get this up here. All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here talking to you about bugs. This is one of my favorite subjects. Um, the uh, critters we're talking about today, and I'm not sharing my screen right, give me one sec. There we go, that's better. Thank you, sorry about that. Um, so, Last week, you guys learned about fish. And a lot of people know at least a little bit about fish. Some of these critters, I didn't even know existed till I started studying them for work. So I'm really excited to share some of them with you guys today. And critters like these aquatic invertebrates are the base of the food chain. And I think a lot of people know about food chains. You know, we have a big top predator like a sea lion and those guys eat the big fish. Big fish eat little fish. But how many people know what little fish eat? Little fish, besides eating even smaller fish, eat bugs. And these are the base of this food chain. They're the, the source of all the meat that the fish want to eat. But it's not really just a chain. It's part of a whole complex food web. And uh, there are multiple big top carnivores like this bird. Um, one sec. Like we've got birds that eat the big fish. We've got people that fish the big fish and sea lions. There's multiple kinds of big fish. 
there's many different kinds of small fish and those small fish are eating these little tiny bugs, some of which are too small to see. Um, and the bugs are eating little tiny plants or taking pieces of larger plants. And when I talk to you about bugs, as I said in the beginning, it's this really large group of critters. If I ask you, you know, what's your favorite animal, you're probably gonna say something with a backbone, like a dog or a horse or a frog, or if you're really cool, a fish. These are all what we call vertebrates because they have a backbone and the little bones in your spine are called vertebrae. So we're the vertebrates because we have vertebrae. Everything else are invertebrates, so no backbones. And this group is so big, almost 95% of all animals are invertebrates, no backbones. Some of them are more different from each other than a person is from a frog. Some of them have lots of legs, 20, 30 legs. Some of them have no legs. Some of them have tentacles. Some of them are huge, like giant squid. Some of them are microscopic. You can't see them without a really high powered microscope. So it's this really cool group of critters that I'm just gonna brush the surface of today. They also live in all sorts of different types of homes and have different ways of living, kind of similar to their different body shapes. Some of them float in the water and eat little bits of stuff that are also floating in the water or eat each other. These are what we call zooplankton. Zoo for, you know, like going to the zoo and watching animals, meaning they're animals. Plankton means floater, so they're floating animals. Then we have some bugs that live on the surface of the water. You've probably seen water striders sl um, sliding across the surface of a pond before. Other critters burrow in the mud, especially things like clams or worms. They'll get hunked down in the mud and just reach a little piece up into the water to collect food so they'll be safe and nothing can eat them, but they can eat the food. Then lots of critters live on plants that are also in the water and they'll eat the algae off the plants or chew on the plants themselves. And the plants provide a good place for them to hide from predators. But the question you might be asking yourself is why do we care? Why is my job studying bugs? Well, one of the important reasons why we study bugs, especially here in the Delta, is they help tell us how clean the water is. There are certain bugs that only live in the most crystal clear, perfect streams. They can't handle any pollution at all. Others might be able to handle a little bit of pollution, but not too much. So you might find them in more in the countryside where there's a little bit of runoff from farms, fertilizer, cow poop, stuff like that, that gets in the water, but it's not too bad. So we find these critters, they're, you know, a little bit tolerant in there. But if we had like a huge industrial plant spewing toxic gunk into the water, fortunately not too many of those in California, we only find the hardiest critters that can survive in any situation. Now, I could go out and take a bottle of water from each of these streams, go into a lab and do a lot of really complex chemistry to tell me what was there but it would only tell me what was there right when I went out. Whereas the bugs that are in the water, they're in the water for weeks or months. And so knowing what kind of bugs live there, tell us what's been going on over the past weeks or months. And it's a lot faster and easier than doing the complex analytical chemistry. Another reason we care about bugs is they're good fish food. Fish need to eat and we like eating fish. So, some years there's a whole lot of salmon in the rivers and it's really great. Other years, not so much. And as someone who works for the Department of Water Resources, we care, you know, why some animals are doing good in some years and some aren't. So if we go out and sample the bugs and we find there's just not a lot of bugs this year, well, that explains why there's not a lot of fish. If there's a ton of bugs, we're likely to get more fish. If there's a ton of bugs and still no fish, then we think there's probably something else going wrong that we need to investigate. 
Also, we care about bugs because they're just plain cool. They have lots of really cool features and ways of living that are so different from us. That's just really interesting to learn about. So how do we collect bugs? Well, the Department of Water Resources and the Department of Fish and Wildlife work together to monitor the bugs and fish that are in the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. So we've got a big boat, a bunch of big boats that'll go out there and look at the bugs. For those zooplankton, the little floating critters in the water, we have a mesh with a net with really fine mesh that will drag behind the boat to catch the critters. Then we'll take them back to the lab and look at them under a microscope. The critters that burrow in the mud is a little harder because you know the boat will be in 20, 30 feet of water and the mud is way down at the bottom. And so what do you do? Well, we've got this really cool tool that is kind of like that claw game at the arcade that um, gets the uh, toy thing for you. Well, we've got one of those that will drop down to the bottom, close and it'll take a big chunk of mud and the bugs in the mud and pull it up again. Then we'll rinse the mud out and look at the bugs. So pretty cool. And like I said, we've got this survey that will go out in these boats every month, all year, all over the Delta through here, through Sassoon Marsh and Sassoon Bay, and into San Pablo Bay and San Francisco Bay, almost to the ocean. The cool thing is we find different bugs in different places because out in the Delta, the water's really fresh, hardly any salt at all, usually no salt at all. Um, and so we get a lot of insects and certain kinds of critters that really only live in fresh water. In the area that gets a little bit salty, but not super salty, we'll get different critters. And then when you get out into the bay, when it's as salty as the sea, we have another set of critters, like this crab larva here. He only lives in really salty water. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to introduce you to some of my favorite bugs. These are my best friends. I'm a dork. My only friends are bugs. Um, and these are my besties. So copepods, super, super cool. You guys might have seen SpongeBob SquarePants. If you do, you remember Plankton. He was the bad guy. He was a copepod. Real copepods are actually good guys. Um, they're really good fish food, especially for the little baby fish. And uh, one of the cool things about copepods is they swim with their antennae. So the little things on the head of most bugs that are usually just feelers, they actually use to swim through the water like a person doing the butterfly and they're really fast. If you calculate speed in terms of how many body lengths per second something goes instead of how many feet per second, they're some of the fastest swimmers in the world. Next up, we have Clodosera. These guys are also called water fleas. Not a terribly good name because they don't bite like fleas do. They do kind of look like they're jumping around like a flea. They're also really good fish food, but they don't like being eaten by fish. And so some kinds of Clodocera have this really cool tool in their toolkit to save themselves from being eaten. These two guys here, you see one has a really long spine and one doesn't. Well, they're actually the same species. If you put these guys in a pond with no fish, they won't have long spines. If you put a fish in the pond, the Clodocera will smell the fish coming and they'll grow a spine over the course of a day or two so they're too spiny for the fish to eat. That's just crazy cool. The other crazy cool thing about Podocera is they can clone themselves. So they can have sexual reproduction the same way most animals do. Male fertilizes the female's eggs, or the female can just clone herself and make babies without any males involved. I think that's pretty cool too. Who needs guys? Next up, amphipods. These guys are one of my favorites. I have a lot of favorites. Uh, so they are also called scuds and they live in a whole bunch of different places. Some will burrow in the mud and just stick their antennae out to collect food. Some will live on plants and graze little bits of algae off the plants. Others will swim in the water. And you'll notice a lot of these pictures I have are, all the critters are bright pink. Well, that's actually not their real color. 
they're actually kind of boring brownish colored. But if you have a bunch of mud and a bunch of brown mud and a bunch of brown bugs in the brown mud, they're very hard to find. So in order to see them more easily, we put this pink dye in there and all the bugs turn bright pink and we can pick them out really easily. Next up, another favorite of mine, the damselfly. So you've probably seen the adult damselflies sitting on reeds by the water. They're really pretty iridescent blues and greens. Well, turns out when they start their lives, they live in the water. This is a damselfly baby or larva as we call him. Um, and they will live in the water, usually sitting on plants, eating other bugs. Uh, and just the way caterpillars grow up to be butterflies, damselfly larvae grow up to be damselflies. One of the cool bits is they have these um, gills sticking off their butt. They look kind of like almost mini wings, but they actually use those to get oxygen out of the water. Fish have their gills, you know, on their neck. These gill guys have gills on their butts, which is, this goes to show you, it takes all kinds. Okay, next up, freshwater mussels. You might have been at a restaurant and had a lovely bowl of steamed mussels and some butter and lemon sauce. Well, we have freshwater mussels that live in our lakes and streams rather than those marine mussels that live in the ocean. And one of the cool things about these guys is they have this really complex life cycle. Their larvae, their babies, start out being spewed out into the water, floating around in the water, and then they become parasites on fish gills. So they're like getting a tick, but it's on the fish's gill. And they'll stick on the gill for a couple of weeks, get a little bigger, suck fish blood like you do, then drop out, burrow into the mud and start growing into adult clams. They're very sensitive to the pollution and they grow very slowly. Like I said, they have this complex life history it's three or four years before they reach adulthood um, and they're very sensitive to pollution. So they're not doing that great. Um, so if you ever see any, consider yourselves lucky. One of the reasons they're not doing that great is that there are some invasive clams that have come and taken over some of the habitat from the native mussels. These guys reproduce very quickly and they filter a lot of water very fast. Now, most people say, oh, filtering water, that's great, right? Clean water. Well, the water has all the food that all the critters need. So the zooplankton, the copepods, the cladocera, all the critters I've been talking about, most of them eat little bits of stuff that are floating in the water. And the clams, which are not native to this area, take all that stuff out of the water. The last critter I wanna share with you, this one really is my favorite. This is the spongella fly. So when they're an adult, it just looks like, you know, a bug like you might see in your garden called lace wings sometimes. But their larvae, their babies, start out life in the water as parasites on freshwater sponges. So again, with the reference to SpongeBob SquarePants, he was a marine sponge. And you might have seen pictures of sponges and coral reefs but we have sponges that live in our lakes and streams too. And some, most of them are bright green because they actually have algae that live inside them. The algae makes food for the sponge, the sponge makes a home for the algae. And then the spongella fly comes and sticks his nose into the sponge and sucks out the juices, kind of the way an aphid will take over your rose plant. Usually it's not enough to really hurt the sponge. Uh, and after a couple weeks, the spongella fly turns into an adult and flies away to find another sponge to lay his egg on. And those are all my favorite bugs. And I would be absolutely happy to uh, take some questions. Right. Thank you, Rosie. That was really interesting. And um, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is from Peter, who says he also loves damselflies. Um, and he wants to know how sensitive they are to water quality. 
And also, does this sensitivity change in different life stages? Um, I don't know if it changes in different life stages. Obviously, when they're an adult, they don't care as much about water quality because they're not breathing the water anymore. Uh, but when they're like a really little baby versus a moderately big larva, I'm not sure. Uh, all, in terms of their sensitivity, they're not the most sensitive. Um, they can't handle really polluted water, but a little bit of pollution, they're usually okay. Uh, we find them all over the Delta. Um, and the Delta is not the cleanest water, but it's not the dirtiest either. So um, that's an indication that they're relatively hardy. All right. Um, not a question, but a comment from Diego who says that he also really likes bugs and he thinks that you are super cool for liking them too. Oh, good. <laughs> um, we have a question here about climate change. How is climate change impacting um, the, the bugs in the Delta? Well, the biggest impact of climate change so far um, that we're seeing is that we're getting a lot of uh, major droughts. And when droughts come, that seawater moves further inland. So remember when I was talking about how we find different bugs in different areas of the Delta due to how much salt there was in the water? When that salt starts pushing further in, then we have different bugs coming in and the bugs that really like fresh water get squeezed up the upstream end of the Delta. But um, in the future, we might see higher water temperatures as well, which is gonna also mean we have different kinds of bugs that live in the Delta. Is ocean acidification impacting any of the bugs? Not that much in the fresher regions. Mm -hmm. I don't tend to spend a lot of time looking at the really salty area. Mm -hmm. And usually that's the area where ocean acidification is a big problem. Freshwater acidification has not really is not really a major factor in um, any of the critters we're looking at up here. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see, I have another question here. Um, how have the levees impacted the, the food web or the bugs in the Delta? Yeah, well, 150 years ago, when Europeans first came to California, the whole Delta was a giant wetland. So if you see the picture behind me, all these tall grasses, um, this picture was taken in Sassoon Marsh, which still has a lot of freshwater wetland. In the Delta, we put up levees and drained all that wetland to grow farmland, which obviously is a person who likes eating crops that come from a farm. I can't totally criticize people for building more farmland, but it took away a lot of the wetlands. And that wetlands were great places for bugs and fish to grow up. Uh, I talk about all the bugs that live on plants. Well, we took away a lot of the plants basically and um, that those levees blocked that pathway for bugs to move through all these plants and really uh, decrease the amount of available bugs for the fish to eat. Great, so, and, and I'm sorry, were you gonna say something else? Oh, um, well, I, I should add that Department of Water Resources and um, several other agencies are working on restoring some of the wetlands in the Delta in areas that are no longer farmed, pushing some holes in some of those levees to um, put in more wetlands to get more bugs growing, get more fish, and try and restore some of the habitat that was lost. Great. Um, so Brian wants to know, he says that he's heard that some of the mayflies and stoneflies, which are some of the bugs that um, only live in the cleanest of water, mm -hmm. that some of them may be uh, developing tolerance for higher pollution levels. Have you encountered that? I haven't encountered that with stoneflies and mayflies in particular. Uh, they are some of the critters that really only live in the cleanest streams. However, there's been some studies from some um, researchers at uh, UC Berkeley and UC Davis looking at some of the amphipods. And these critters we usually use to test and see how much pollution is in the water. So we'll take some water, bring it into a lab, stick some amphipods in there and see if they die basically. Um, and they found that the ones that they grow in the lab that never have any pollution on them until we do these tests, those are really sensitive to pollution. We'll go out, 
in the environment and collect the same exact species of anthropod, if it's from an area with a lot of pollution, we'll find that they're really tolerant of the pollutant now. So there is definitely evidence of really rapid evolution of tolerance to some of these uh, pesticides. Pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Uh, Sherry wants to know if the muscles that you're talking about are the same inv invasive muscles that are, um, um, people are warned about when they're taking their boats out on lakes. No. So I talked about two different critters that were relatively similar, the muscles that are native. Those are not invasive. They're native to this area. Um, they grow, like I said, really slowly. The invasive clams, um, those are reproduce really fast, but they don't tend to stick to boats. The ones that people are really worried about are the ones that aren't here yet. In the Great Lakes, there is an invasive mussel, the zebra mussel, and then another one called the quagga mussel um, that just grow so fast and they'll impress themselves all over boats, all over like water control structures, major like pipes to get water out and they'll be just full of these zebra mussels. They'll take over everything. And so people want to make sure that your boats are really clean to make sure that you have not come from anywhere where these muscles might have been, that we really don't want them here. Absolutely. No, don't want the invasive species coming in. Um, is there a follow up to what you were talking about earlier with climate change? Is there a negative um, consequence to the, the saltwater bugs? coming further inland with, um, with climate change and the freshwater bugs being um, squeezed upstream? Well, it's negative for the freshwater bugs for sure. Um, also, the whole community is shifting. So it's interesting saying, okay, is it good? Is it bad? Well, mm -hmm. it's different. And we would like things, we would like our ecosystem to remain relatively the same because we really value our ecosystem and any changes, some critters are gonna be able to respond to change. Some probably aren't. So some of those saltwater bugs probably won't move and some of the freshwater bugs won't have anyone to get anywhere to get squeezed to and we'll end up with less biodiversity overall. So I think that is a negative impact. So um, I have time for about one more question um, and I'd like to pose one to you. I had never heard of freshwater sponges before you talked about them today. Um, what do we, can you tell us a little bit more about those? What do we know about them? We don't know a lot. There's not a lot of research on them. Um, they have this symbiotic algae that they grow with. Um, we know they're found all over North America. I've seen them in crystal clear mountain lakes and I've seen them in the Delta. So um, I don't know what their pollution tolerance is, what their range is, even what kind of species we have here is not well understood. I think it's an area that a lot of research needs to be done in. They filter a lot of water. You know, a one square inch chunk of sponge can filter a bathtub full of water every day. Wow. Um, so, you know, if these invasive clams are really impacting the water quality, what are the sponges doing? No one knows. Uh, they haven't had a lot of love. And um, unfortunately that means it's hard to get money to study them. But I think if enough people were interested and we wrote a good enough proposal, we could find someone who uh, might fund us to study some sponges because they're pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Well, thank you. Um, for those people who, whose questions I wasn't able to get to, um, I do apologize. You asked some really great one and actually there's one more I'm going to throw out at you, Rose. Um, sure. Why is less biodiversity bad? Why do we care about that? Oh, <laughs> not a quick can, answer. Give I me know. A, a softball question for my last one. Thanks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a good it's question. Good as a scientist, I don't really talk about things being good or bad. I talk about what is there and what the potential for change is. As a environmentalist and someone who loves bugs and loves nature, less biodiversity is bad because the United States decided that we wanted all of our biodiversity when we passed the Endangered Species Act. 
we said that every single species counts. We as a culture care about biodiversity. Also, in a rapidly changing environment, especially with climate change, we don't know what critters are gonna come out on top. They're all part of this complex web that has different uh, functions. And humans, as we as humans rely on a lot of these functions. Um, plants take carbon dioxide out of the air and give us oxygen. And if we had only two species of plants instead of 200 species of plants, Maybe it would do the same thing, but it might be a lot worse for us. So keeping the biodiversity alive makes the system more resilient to stress. Um, if something happens, it can recover faster and it hedges our bets. We don't know what species we're gonna need in the future for our own you know, human needs. So keeping all of them just seems like a smart idea. Thank you. I'm just, that, that was a pretty tough question to end on, but um, I want to thank you. I, I'd like to thank everybody at home for joining us. Um, and again, to Rosie for introducing us to some of your favorite Delta bugs. We will be back next Wednesday at one o'clock. Um, we'll be hearing about the frequent flyers of the Delta, um, some of the different birds that live in the Delta, including uh, Swainson hawks and sandhill cranes. So if you like birds, you'll definitely want to join us. And if you would like to learn more about California's amazing Delta, you can always visit our webpage at water.ca.gov. We have a page devoted specifically to the Delta, our Water Basics page. And if um, you have got some kids at home or there's some kids watching who would like some fun activities to do about the Delta, you can order them off of our education materials page. So thank you again, Rosie. Thank you again, everybody who joined us today. And uh, we hope to see you here again next week.